Hello, everybody. Today, we'll be discussing aphantasia, mental imagery, and its relationship with memory with researcher Merlin Monsell. Monsell specializes in multisensory imagery and is head of the aphantasia research project at the University of Bonn. Among other things, he and his team are investigating the causes and consequences of aphantasia by using objective methods to measure mental imagery. Today, we delve into Monfeld's latest study, where he and his team explored autobiographical memories and their neural correlate in individuals with aphantasia. For those joining us for the first time, we'll start with a 20 or 30 minute presentation, followed by a short question and answer period. You can use the live chat in any time to post your questions and try to get to as many as we can. Without any further ado, Merlin, welcome back. Hello, nice to be here. Thank you uh, very much for joining us. We'll kick it off. I'll give you about 30 minutes. You'll have the floor. You can start maybe with just a short introduction for those who may be seeing you for the first time. And then I'll join you back after the presentation. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Nelly Monsel. I'm working at the University of Bonn, and I will present you some results about autobiographical memory, deficits, and aphantasia and their uh, underlying rural causes. I would like to start with a short experiment and ask you to remember the last time you were on holiday. How was it like? Do you remember the sea? And can you hear the sound of the waves? What color was the beach? And how did the sand feel between your toes? Remember your holiday in every possible detail. And now think about it. What is it like to remember? How does it work? What does your brain actually do? Normally, when remembering, people create a semantic schedule, which consists mainly of texts such as where have I been on holiday, when have I been on holiday, and with whom have I been on holiday. However, at this stage, these are only semantics. There is no quality of reliving. You only know this has happened to you, but you don't re-experience it. After the semantic scaffold is created, people start to fill the scaffold with episodic details, which are often sensory in nature. For example, how warm was the sun? Which color had the buckets? Or how did the hot dog taste like? Many of you might experience problems with this step because you cannot create method imagery to re-experience these sensory sensations. So let me ask you a question. What colors were the eyes of the girl on my slides. Some of you might simply know the answer, but for the others, can you really visualize the girl? Probably not. How, how are you supposed to re-experience the girl's eye color? How is it possible? For those uh, who are interested, uh, the eye color was Overall, we know from previous research that episodic details are important for what you memory. But episodic details are sensory simulations which uh, need uh, mental imagery, and aphantasics cannot create mental imagery. So we ask the following research question How does autobiographical memory actually work without mental imagery? How do aphantasics remember? Plonkwist uh, proposes the following model to answer this question. The semantic scaffold is created via semantic retrieval processes. This is the left part of our model. The yes, semantic scaffold. For the episodic details, on the other hand, we need sensory retrieval processes, which is the, the right part of our model. The sen uh, episodic uh, retrieval process leads to an output of either remembering these details or imagining these details. This is this part of the model. Importantly, memories and mental images are equated in this output. We can say remembering is imagining the past and imagining is recombining past experiences. So it's actually the same. Next, we have to look at the neural resources associated with the sensory retrieval processes. The sensory retrieval process is thought to be coordinated by an episodic memory index, which can be compared to an address book in which coordinates of our memories are located. According to one theory, this address book is located in the so-called hippocampus. This is a brain region known to involve in autobiographical memory. 
The actual regional retrieval process, however, is located more downstream in our brain, most likely in the regional cortex where visual information is processed, for example, during seeing or during mental injury. So we might ask the following question. What is the role of these two structures during memory retrieval in Aphantasics? What does the hippocampus do and what does the regional cortex do? Because normally both uh, brain regions would be involved in autobiographics and memory, but when no episodic details can be retrieved by Aphantasics, maybe there is no activation at all. To answer this question, we collect the data from 14 Aphantasics and 16 demographically matched controls. The group allocation was based on the vividness of visual imagery questionnaire, which I am sure most of you know by now. However, the group all allocation was validated on the basis of a binocular rivalry task. In the binocular rivalry task, we used an apparatus with which we present two different images, in this case, green lines and red lines, to one of each eyes for participants. Normally, both eyes perceive the same. But now, both eyes have to compete for the truth for the real image. And this leads to a 50-50 perception of both images. At one time, I see the green lines, but at another time, I see the red lines. This is represented by this line at 50% in this figure. However, when imagining one of the ones beforehand, the likelihood increases that participants perceive what I have imagined before. This is represented here in this bar where the likelihood increases to 60% for control participants to see the lines that they had imagined before. But this is only true for non aphantasics As you can see here at the right bar, aphantasics are still primed at random. They have still a 50-50 chance to see the red or the green red lines, regardless of what they had imagined before, because there is no actual image that could prime this head gene. So with this data, we can show that in our experiment, the both groups actually differed. We have the methantastic group who was not able to create mental imagery and was not primed by it. And you have the control participants who were actually primed by their mental imagery and who can thus create mental images in their mind. So we have established the two, the two groups. Now we want to compare the autobiographic and memory these two groups. For this, uh, we used an autobiographical interview by Levine and colleagues, as well as an autobiographical memory tasks while our participants were lying in an MRI. In the MRI task, we asked participants to remember certain situations, for example, the first time going abroad, and then they had eight seconds to, re to relive this memory in as much detail as possible. After that, they were asked whether the memory was detailed or faint. There was also a control task in which participants were asked to solve simple math questions, for example, 35 plus uh, N, and then they had eight seconds to add three over and over again. However, this was only done to control for some processes not related to autobiographic memory. We can look at the results of all autobiographic memory. And we can see, as expected, reported less episodic details then controls are represented by the red bars and controls are represented by the blue bar. And this was true for remote and recent memories. For both cases, the Fantasics were less likely to remember a detailed scenario. However, for semantic memory details, for the semantic scaffold, there was no difference. This leads to the conclusion that Fantasics can build the semantic scaffold. There's no difference at all but they cannot populate the semantic scaffold with sensory details, which is apparent in this difference. Next, we looked at our two predefined uh, brain regions, the hippocampus and the visual cortex, to examine whether both structures have social differences in the activations. What we can see is that during autobiographic memory, aphantastics showed less activation in the hippocampus. This is the hippocampus, and the activation was lower. Moreover, we can see that in the visual cortex, this is this part of the figure, the activation was higher in synthetics than for controls. This is also represented in this figure with higher red bars for synthetics. One uh, important result was 
less activation in the samples, more activation in the residual cortex. Moreover, we conducted a connectivity analysis to examine whether both brain regions communicate with each other. We could see that in uh, control participants, there was a good connection between campus and um, visual cortex. So both structures were communicating, but in aphantasics, the communication was nearly zero. This led to our conclusion that our episodic memory index, which is located in the campus, might not be able to retrieve visual details from the visual cortex since they are not communicated. I'd like to summarize our results shortly. We found that FNTELMIX reported less episodic memory details than controls. However, there was no difference between semantic memory details. So the semantic scaffold was the same, but the sensory reliving was diminished in In the MRI, we found less activation in the hippocampus where the episodic memory index is located and more activation in the visual cortex where we think the visual retrieval process is located. Moreover, the connectivity between these both regions was nearly zero in epithetics, while it controls both regions that communicating with each other. Now we have to ask us the question, what can we deduce from this, these results? Given that episodic memory and method imagery are equated within our model, which was proposed by Blomquist, we can probably draw some conclusions about causes of aphantasia, since when memory is disrupted in aphantasia, this might be the same neural resources which are disrupted in mental imagery. First, we interpreted that aphantasia could be caused by an altered connectivity between several regions that are involved in mental imagery. In our case, the hippocampus and the visual cortex. Um, this was also support, supported by a study uh, of Milton et al, who found that the connectivity between frontal regions of the visual cortex were reduced in aphantasics compared to hyperphantasics, that is, people with extremely good mental imagery. Less connectivity leads to less mental imagery. But there's a second interpretation. The heightened acti activity in the visual cortex, aphantasics, might interfere with imagery related signals that are taking place in the original cortex. This was also supported by and studied by a few colleagues who found that higher activation of visual areas, which is depicted here on the x-axis, are associated with less imagery priming and thus less mental imagery. This is depicted in this decreasing line. We can compare this to a wizard in a club. The imagery signal is a watch. So this peak here is our imagery signal, or within our metaphor, it's a voice that tries to tell me something. However, the surrounding music in the, in the club is very loud. These peaks are in music, which leads to a bad signal to noise ratio, that's the, the correct term here, so that we cannot extract our imagery signal from the noise that is surrounding it. We cannot hear somebody who is talking to us in the club because it's too loud in the surroundings. So that's our second interpretation, that too much activation in the visual cortex might interfere with imagery signals so that no mental image can be created by absentees. However, we can also speculate whether our two interpretations are compatible with each other. Maybe the connection between the hippocampus and the visual cortex leads to an inhibition of imagery irrelevant segments. So when the communication is high, the noise goes, goes down and the imagery signal can be interpreted. But when there is no communication between these two regions, we cannot downregulate the noise and the Im imagery signal cannot be carved out from the noise. So this could integrate our both interpretations and lead to an explanation model how Asia act actually uh, exists, well, uh, how, how does it uh, evolve. Uh, last, I want to look uh, at our model again to conclude some specific expectations. We found that the semantic scaffolding in Asia, which is this path, was comparable to controls. So we can check this. There's no problem with this process. However, 
the retrieval of episodic details was decreased in FN Hasex. The report had less detail in the autobiographical interview as well as in the autobiographic memory task in the FMRI. In this path, there are alterations between FN Hasex and controls. Last, there's a third path in the middle related to spatial process. While uh, our study did not investigate this process, Bainbridge and colleagues found evidence that this path is also not affected in essence aliens, which would lead us to the conclusion that Tasia affect only the retrieval of episodic details, but not semantic or spatial details. However, there's one last question for future research when looking at this model. There are several sensory retrieval processes, and we only look at the visual retrieval process within our study. So we have to ask, what about the other modalities of sensory mental injury? There are also auditory retrieval processes, gustatory retrieval processes, and so on. When actually the index episodic memory is affected by the fantasia, this should also affect all downstream retrieval processes. When the episodic memory index is affected as a whole, we should find the same results as in our study when remembering sounds, tastes, smells, touches, or even feelings. But that's something for future studies, and we have not looked into it in this Yeah, this was a very short presentation, I think, but I hope I can answer many questions of you. I thank uh, you very much for your attention. And when you are interested in taking part in our studies and lying in, in an MRI or just taking part in an online survey, you can register in our research database via this QR code or this link. Thank you very much.